Um, you've probably noticed already that we are in the season of Christmas. Today is the third Sunday of Advent, and out of interest, I'd like to have a show of hands. Who here has got an Advent calendar? Okay, and then keep your hands up. Whose calendar is made of chocolate? Yeah, it's basically everyone, isn't it? Um, who hasn't got one? Okay, so for those of us like me who hasn't got one, I thought we could have a run-through of what is still available on the internet. So to start, please, Sam Wilkins, are you ready? We have got Bobby Brown, 12 Days of Advent Glow. If you would like to renew your makeup this Christmas, you can do so with this advent calendar, which is being sold for a mere £195, but its contents are worth 264 Next up, we've got Dior, Le Montaigne Advent Calendar, a mere 570 closely followed by Diptyque's Advent Calendar, with candles Eau de Toilette, soaps and luxury hand lotion. That one's £390. Next is my personal favourite, if anyone wants to buy this for me. This is from Fortnum and Masons. It's made of wood, so it's sustainable. You can bring it out every year and give it to your grandchildren. And they say to make every day in December a joy-filled occasion with our Christmas wooden house advent calendar. Behind every store numbered door, you will find an array of sweet delicacies and treats. Isn't that fun? Next up, we have Liberty's 12 Days of Jewellery Advent Calendar, which is currently on sale down to £495, closely followed by Liberty's Beauty Advent Calendar, what Christmas is all about. And um, I was thinking about this, and the Magi presented Jesus with gifts of perfume, smelly spices, and gold. So I suppose in some way you could say that these are the most biblical of the Advent calendars available. Um, but finally, the cheapest, and for the young and the young at heart, we have Lego City Advent calendar, which is a mere trifle at 19.99. Thank you so much. Sam. Now, if I were an alien and I was watching the world from outer space, I would probably look at all of these advent calendars and be like, what on earth is going on? What do Lego and chocolate and Bobby Brown 12 Days of Glow have to do with Christmas? And every year, King's College Cambridge does its traditional um, Christmas service of nine lessons and carols which my mother and my grandmother listen to it's on the radio it's on bbc it is absolutely beautiful and every year this passage that candida read to us in isaiah is the third lesson or the third reading um, and how on earth do advent calendars relate to that passage in isaiah which gets trotted out every yeah, our own carol service here at Ascension last week, which was beautiful. Thank you, Louise, and thank you, everyone in the choir. Um, this passage in Isaiah was our first reading, and I love the Advent season. I love the carols, the choirs, the Christmas wreaths, the candles decorating the tree, the slight panic about whether Royal Mail will deliver everything, the even greater panic when you realise, like James and I, that we actually haven't written any cards yet. Um, Christmas is rightly associated with joy and with warmth. And Advent is that 25-day run-up to the big day. Advent is about waiting. And our passage in Isaiah tells us what we are waiting for. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. We are waiting for the fulfillment of that promise, the promise of the newborn king. That is what Advent is about. It is about waiting for God to fulfill his promises. And it's a beautiful promise, isn't it? The symbolism of the light and the darkness, the echo of the hallelujah chorus from Handel in your head. But, but, somewhere in the coziness of Christmas and the commercialization of Christmas, the starkness of that darkness gets lost. Because the promise of the newborn king, when this was originally written about 750 years before Christ came, 
it was not cosy. It was not Christmas. There were no carols. There were definitely no chocolate advent calendars. And life was pretty bleak. It was rife with the threat of war and invasion. And the prophet Isaiah proclaimed this message at the time of King Ahaz. And this is how the Old Testament chroniclers describe King Ahaz in 2 Kings 16. This is what they say about him. They say he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and even sacrificed his son in the fire, engaging in the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burned incense at the high places, on the hilltops and under every spreading tree. In other words, Ahaz, the king at the time, had rejected the worship of God. And he went in for pagan idolatry. He even went in for child sacrifice. So that the people of God became the people of other gods. And what we see in the Old Testament prophets and in Isaiah is that God never abandons his people, even though they abandon him. In the first few chapters of Isaiah, we find him prophesying against the corruption that he sees in Jerusalem. He proclaimed a God who was holy and just to a people and to a king who had gone astray. And his message is actually pretty strong. Even though this is a beautiful passage, just before it in chapter 3, Isaiah proclaims that Jerusalem will stagger and Judah will fall because of their rebellion. And he warns of the threat of invasion, which eventually comes. And yet, in the midst of the pain, we have the promise. Because Isaiah also proclaims hope. And that hope was the promise of a new king. To us, a son is given. And when we read this at carol services, we forget how dark things actually were. If you look at verse 1 of your Bible, it says, In the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honour Galilee of the nations. And we read that and we think, yes, Jesus was in Galilee. I know what this is about. And you're right. But if you were living in the time of Isaiah in the 8th century, if you heard that, you would know in the very recent past that the king of Assyria had invaded and had overrun those very areas. And even worse, he had deported Israelites living there to Assyria as basically slaves. And if you were living in the time of Isaiah, you would know that Israel was not a united nation. It was divided between the north and the south, the kingdom of Israel versus the kingdom of Judah, and they were always at war with each other. So at this time, a Syrian Israelite invasion was coming against Judah. And Ahaz, the weak king, the king who's into worshipping other gods, has decided that the only way out of this is to try and make an alliance with the Assyrian king. And spoiler alert, it doesn't go very well. And when Isaiah says the people are walking in darkness, he is not kidding. And then he goes on in verse 2, they're living in the land of great darkness. And that can be translated as well as living in the shadow of death. So this is stark stuff. It is exactly the opposite of a cozy candlelit Christmas. And that's why it gets worse. We've got warriors and yokes and blood and burdens and rods of oppressors in verses 4 to 5, which seems a bit unfamiliar because it usually gets missed out at carol services because it doesn't fit the flow. But that's what life was. It was dark and it was dangerous. And God gives the promise of a newborn king. And in the 8th century BC period, most people would not have got Jesus. When they thought, oh, there's going to be a newborn king, they would have thought a royal king, not Jesus. At the time, they probably thought this would have been about the baby king, Hezekiah, who was Ahaz's son, who did become a good king and restored right worship. They they didn't have a clue about the Messiah in the way that we understand it. 
and it's debatable whether Isaiah himself would have known. <laughs> that there was another newborn king waiting to be born, lying in a manger. But our passage in Isaiah 9 hints that this is beyond just the time, beyond that darkness, and that this is no ordinary king. It says in verse 7 that he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. That means that that kingdom that was split and divided and at war with itself would be united and would become whole again. And this child, it will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And it's these words that the gospel writers Luke and Matthew take from this passage and interpret it in the light of Jesus and his ministry. Because they looked back at the big story of God and recognized that ultimately Jesus is the one who came to fulfill the promise. That he is the true prince of peace who shines a light in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And you might sit here and think, well, that's all very well, Amanda, but that's all a bit strange. Like, how do I relate Isaiah in 720 BC to my life now? But what I love about the Old Testament, which we don't always spend enough time in, is that we see the promises of God being fulfilled because the word of God is living and active. And it's being shaped in us today because God's word is alive. An Old Testament prophecy was not a prediction of the future in the sense of Isaiah holding a crystal ball and seeing what is going to come up. But the prophets were called to be the voice of God bringing conviction against the corruption of the monarchy and against the kings like Ahaz who led people astray. The main role of the prophetic voice in the Old Testament was to call God's people back to repentance. So the prophet brings the voice of God and the promises of God to allow the people to respond and to repent. And when God makes a promise, he holds true to it. And in scripture, we see God fulfilling his promises again and again. That's why Jesus ultimately is the fulfillment of this promise, that he is the true prince of peace. But like I said, this passage, it isn't cozy. It also speaks about war and oppression and bloodshed and the shadow of death. And when Jesus came, he came into an occupied Israel that was still in oppression and the shadow of death. And we know that we are still living in a time where even now there is war in that part of the world. And we still live in a time with poverty and disease and famine and political corruption. Justice and righteousness, as it promises in verse 7, have not yet been fully realized in the world. Advent is about God fulfilling his promise. And we are still waiting for those promises to be finally realized. We are still waiting for God to fulfill his promises. We are still waiting. Dietrich um, Bonhoeffer, who is one of my favorite theologians and was a German pastor during the Second World War, gave a sermon on Advent Sunday. And he said this about Advent. He said, Advent is a waiting for nothing less than that this world will be redeemed through and through not by this or that political means, but by God, that God himself will come to us. It is because God has come that we wait. Our waiting and hoping, it's not like a piece of wishful thinking, a fantasy, but life itself. We live only because we wait for God. We live today under the shadow of his coming, not some dreaded disasters, some fate, but the coming of the God of justice, of love and of peace, not finding our own way into the future to God, but receiving the future from God. We know that we cannot go to God, but God comes to us, enfolding us in his unbelievable grace. Otherwise, our life is lost, our waiting is in vain. We can only wait, watchfully wait, 
That means passionately waiting, totally deaf to those who sow doubts in our mind, blind to every power that stands between us and the future God wills for us. One thing is needful, the conviction that we shall see God, we shall hear God, we shall receive God, we shall know God, we shall serve God. In some incomprehensible way, God will, otherwise nothing absolutely nothing else counts. Now, when Bonhoeffer preached that, the year was 1931, and he could not have predicted the exact events of the next 15 years. And when he died in 1945, he didn't see the end of the war. But he believed that God would fulfill his promises. Otherwise, nothing else counts. And we've been waiting for that promise of justice and righteousness to be fulfilled ever since Jesus ascended into heaven 2023-ish years ago. We're waiting for him to come back. The word Advent means arrival. Advent will continue after Christmas, and so will the darkness that is around us. But so does the light which shines in the darkness. Jesus means Emmanuel, God is with us, and he is with us now to enable us to shine brightly in our present darkness, just as Joanna was leading us in prayer earlier. And um, in the season of waiting, I have been waiting uh, for my mother's Christmas pudding ever since she sent a photo of the mix-up day in November and um, on the family WhatsApp chat. And it's my favorite moment of Christmas when it gets brought to the table and it's a light and we turn the lights off and uh, we're big on the Christmas pudding tradition in my family. And I know that it's no point going to the supermarket and getting an overly sweet counterfeit version because it will not be as good as the original maternal pudding. I know that if I wait for another eight days, I can have the real thing. And I wonder what you are waiting for. What promises of God have yet to be fulfilled in your life? Are you content to wait for the real thing? Or are you running after a counterfeit version? The commercialization of Christmas is undoubted. And sometimes it can be a reminder of all the things that we want, but we don't have or the things that we think we want, but actually aren't the things that we need. And some of those can be very real. The right job, the perfect house, the happy family that smiles perfectly for every photo, enough money to afford it all, the Fortnum and Mason advent calendar, again, if anyone wants to give that to me, health, well-being, contentment, and the coziness of Christmas is rightly a time of joy and celebration, and that is a good thing, but it can also make us disinclined to pay attention to all of the things going on around us. If I'm honest, right now, I would rather read another article in the newspaper about how to make the perfect stuffing recipe than to read another article about war in the world. I would rather be ignorant, and I'm guessing I'm not the only one who feels that way at the moment. Christmas brings up a lot of different things. And it's also a reminder of all the things that I'm grateful for. It's an opportunity to reset before the new year. It's a time to think and pray and thank God that he has come to us, that he is Emmanuel, and that he will come again to renew all things. He will fulfill his promises to us, to us as individuals, to the world through the gift of the newborn king. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This passage reminds us that God's plan is bigger than just us, bigger even than international warfare, that his heart is for justice, and that his promises will be fulfilled, and they are worth waiting for. And we're going to go into um, a time of worship now. So the band would like to come up. And we're going to celebrate communion together. Um, But can I encourage you to use this time maybe to bring to God those things which you are waiting for, whatever they are. And to rest in the truth that God is 
faithful. He will bring to completion what he has started. And I want to read those incredible verses again from Isaiah about the newborn king that is born to us. It says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Amen.